ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be at this moment on planet Earth. And uh, welcome to one of the most prominent sessions of this year's 30th annual Arab US Policy Makers Conference. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the area where America's armed forces have been mobilized and deployed now, not for years, but for decades, uh, a task with enhancing uh, the nature and the extent of America's legitimate needs, concerns, interests, and key foreign policy and national security objectives. But in concert with our friends, our allies, and our strategic working uh, partners, uh, 25 years ago, many Americans, when they heard of the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, thought that it was uh, the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps, um, or they weren't sure whether it was an animal, vegetable, or a mineral. <clears throat> but it certainly has become more of a household word <clears throat> to foreign affairs practitioners since then. And consider what we have done together uh, with this particular region. Uh, we work together cooperatively, uh, mobilizing and deploying 55,000 American service personnel in 1987 to bring about an end one year later to the 1980-88 Iran-Iraq war, which threatened regional stability and security and the prospects for peace and prosperity uh, for the better part of that decade. And then within three years, <clears throat> uh, we mobilized and deployed again, this time 550,000, primarily to Saudi Arabia, but to elsewhere, Bahrain and uh, uh, countries <clears throat> in the immediate region uh, to reverse Iraq's aggression against Kuwait. And US Central Command was the pivot and the tip of the spear for the internationally concerted action of 34 nations that restored safety and security and sovereignty to the people of, of Kuwait. And even now in the rearview mirror regarded as a case where we did the right things the right way at the right time for the right people. And guess what? The right results in terms of restoring Kuwait's national sovereignty, political independence and territorial integrity. <clears throat> and then of course, in 2003, uh, we mobilized and deployed once more uh, with regard to the toppling of uh, Iraq's uh, dictator, President Saddam Hussein. Uh, but beyond that, look what we've done under General McKenzie's command and leadership and guidance with regard to Afghanistan and evacuating 120,000 uh, people from Kabul and working with that partner, Qatar, uh, which is the headquarters of the forward deployed command in the region. No other two countries on the planet could have done what we did on that extraordinary logistical and administrative uh, challenge. Uh, only Qatar had the wherewithal, the means, the aircraft, the runways, and only the United States had the power for strategic lift uh, to do this. China could not do that, Russia could not do that, neither could France or Great Britain or the four of them combined. So look what we've accomplished together. And in between these states and achievements, uh, we worked together assiduously to in effect drive the last nail in the coffin of the Red Army. And shortly thereafter, the implosion of the Soviet Union occurred. And now we have the Russian Federation. Uh, to introduce our commanding general for all of these forces uh, with his area of responsibility uh, is the ambassador of Egypt, which is appropriate because one out of four of all Arabs on earth is an Egyptian. And Egypt's population of 100 to 110 million uh, itself dwarfs that of numerous other Arab countries combined. Another 22 member states of the League of Arab States, which is headquartered in, in Egypt. Uh, Egypt uh, is also a country that possesses the Suez Canal, which is a vital 
geostrategic and mill to mill, military to military uh, significance. Uh, ambassador Mortaz Zahran is the ambassador of Egypt to the United States. And what could be more fitting than to have an ambassador whose background has included a previous stint at the embassy uh, in the last decade and a half, dealing with political matters and congressional affairs. So he knows the inner workings of the US problem solving foreign policy making and decision making process. But he's also been a member of Egypt's permanent mission to the United Nations, where his specialization has been on disarmament and international uh, security issues. What could be more fitting uh, than to have the ambassador of Egypt introduce the commanding general of the United States Central Command, Ambassador Zafran. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony, uh, for the kind uh, introduction. Let me, uh, at the outset, express my appreciation and, and gratitude to the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations for inviting me to participate in the Council's annual conference. It is always a, a pleasure to take part in the Council's events, which are persistently of top-notch standard and high-end uh, quality. It is uh, concurrently deeply insightful to always keep track of Dr. Anthony's publications and public appearances, which uh, provide an enlightening vision and a far a sighted source of intellect to the diplomatic community at large and to all the followers of regional and global uh, political dynamics. Um, I'm addressing you today just a week after concluding a new successful round of Egypt-US strategic dialogue which uh, reaffirmed the fundamental and vital importance of the multifaceted partnership between the two nations and reiterated a steadfast commitment to proceed progressively and persistently on the path of strengthening and reinforcing relations in all areas of mutual interest and concern, <clears throat> ranging from mill to mill cooperation to political, economic, commercial, educational, cultural, consular, and legal affairs. Due to the fact that our distinguished speaker in this session, whom I have the pleasure to introduce, to introduce is someone who has an incontrovertible print on the mill-to-mill -mill partnership between Egypt and the US and a broad range of daunting tasks in an ever turbulent region. I will focus my uh, brief remarks on three pertinent points of relevance. First, over the course of more than four decades, the mill-to-mill -mill cooperation has been an entrenched component of the bilateral relations between Egypt and the United States, and has always been regarded as the cornerstone of their deep-rooted partnership. The US has contributed steadily and significantly in equipping the Egyptian military by providing it with sophisticated and advanced military equipment, enabling it to efficiently counter the ever-evolving regional threats. While on the other hand, Egypt helps facilitating the movement of US troops across the region through preferential passage of the Suez Canal and overflights over Egypt's territories, which is indispensable and pricelessly invaluable to advance both US and Egyptian interests in the region. There are other significant examples of ingrained mill-to-mill -mill partnership between the US and Egypt, including but not limited to the synergies between both in diffusing and settling regional crises of global implications, as well as the continued cooperation in the fight against terrorism, in addition to the cardinal role played by the MFO in Sinai supervising the implementation of security provisions of the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Second, Egypt's unique geostrategic location and regional stature make it an indispensable partner and enable it to effectively contribute to efforts aiming at achieving security st stability in the Middle East by confronting the terror trends, radical trends, violence, extremists, and destructive ideologies while 
taking on threats emanating from ra uh, regional actors who have opted to adopt expansionist policies with detrimental impacts on regional stability and a direct bearing on the gradual erosion of the intrinsic concept of the nation state. Third, the mill-to-mill -mill cooperation between Egypt and the US is systematically and methodically managed on both the conceptual and operational venues. Let me exemplify this by referring to two recent developments. Conceptually, the 32nd Mil Military Cooperation Committee was held on seven weeks ago in Cairo. The, the, and this committee is the premier strategic defense dialogue between the two countries that provides the opportunity to conduct in-depth research as well as to engage in constructive exchanges on shared security objectives. The last session focused on border and maritime security, counterterrorism, interoperability between Egypt and the, U and the US forces and Egypt's mil military modernization efforts. Operationally, the Bright Star exercise resumed early September in Egypt with the participation of 21 countries. The focus included interoperability between the participating militaries, maritime security operations in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, and counterterrorism operations. On all counts, this military exercise is a distinct reflection of the long-standing strategic partnership between Egypt and the US. Such a grandiose military exercise was definitely attended and overshone by, uh, in its in, in planning phases by General McKenzie, in conjunction with, of course, colleagues and counterparts. And General McKenzie, of course, a distinguished US military commander, who I assume is enjoying the privilege of not being envied by anyone of his class or those who closely follow the developments in a troubled and raging Middle East. Undoubtedly, the esteemed commander that I am referring to is not just uh, General McKenzie the general, but General McKenzie the persona, the head of the CENTCOM commander and our speaker in this session. As a famous quote goes, it is not enough to be in the right place at the right time. You have to be the right person in the right place at the right time, unquote. This quote is actually very uh, descriptive of General McKenzie, as two different US administrations have trusted his expertise and huge reservoir of wisdom and placed upon him a heavy responsibility due to the tumultuous volatility in the CENTCOM geographic mandate and the mul multiple uh, hotbeds of tensions by appointing him as CENTCOM commander, a confidence which is of course well-placed as General McKenzie is most capable of handling all the critical challenges dil uh, di diligently and vigorously as he ha as has been exhibited throughout the prominence of his exquisite and distinguished military career and illustrious rise. So it is a distinct pleasure to introduce General McKenzie. General McKenzie, the virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Ambassador Zahran, for that warm introduction and for everything you've done over the course of your career to further our common goal of a secure, stable, and prosperous Middle East. Egypt has played a crucial, indeed a decisive, role in advancing the cause of peace in the Middle East for as long as I have worn the uniform of the United States Marine Corps. And I don't care to remind myself how long that's been, so let's just agree that it's been a very long time. One of the most conspicuous and meaningful demonstrations of the United States and Egypt's shared commitment to regional stability is the Bright Star exercise that the ambassador talked about, a series of combined and joint training exercises that began in 1980 and continue to the present day. That first exercise was historic, but relatively humble. Only Egypt and the United States participated, and we sent a lone battalion of the 101st Airborne Division. The most recent iteration, completed in September, involved no fewer than 21 nations, among them some of the, our most important partners in the region, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the Republic of Iraq, the State of Kuwait, and the Kingdom of Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. 
This exercise was not merely grander in scale than the earlier bright stars. It also demonstrated how far, how far we've come in our ability to operate as a coalition at each of the levels of war, from the tactical to the strategic, and in every domain to include cyberspace. None of this would be possible were it not for Egypt's commitment over 40 years ago to become a rock upon which the stability of the broader Middle East could rest. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank Dr. Anthony for again inviting me to deliver the keynote address at this, the 30th annual Arab US Policymakers Conference. It's my privilege to address this body for the third consecutive year, although I would have preferred to have done so in person. Like many of you in the audience, I also suffer from Zoom fatigue, but this is an enormously important conference series, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute, even if it's just virtually. The title of this year's conference is at once timely and timeless, Whither U.S.-Arab Relations, Unnerving Uncertainties Amidst Complex Realities and New Possibilities. Well, when have realities ever been anything but complex, and when haven't uncertainties generated anxiety? That said, we have in the past two years borne witness to some genuinely seismic events in the world and in the U.S. CENTCOM Area of Responsibility, or AOR. And so it's perfectly reasonable that we might ask the question whether U.S. Arab relations with a little more urgency than in any other year. Within our Area of Responsibility, or AOR, I'm referring directly to the end of the U.S. and coalition missions in Afghanistan, a, ge a geopolitical event of the sharp variety with immediate and dramatic consequences, raising understandable questions and concerns about what it means for the future. And I hope to answer some of those questions today and allay some of those concerns with my remarks. On the global scale, it's hard either to minimize or fully appreciate the influence of the coronavirus pandemic on international affairs and security relationships. At the very least, it's fair to say that it hasn't made the already complex business of statecraft any easier. It will probably be years before we can begin to measure and understand the complete and comprehensive effects of the pandemic, by which time COVID-19 will hopefully have become an object of study rather than an active agent in our daily lives. There's another global development that is similarly hard to grasp fully at the moment, but which bears little chance of abating. This is an event of the other sort, grinding, incremental, deliberate, and ultimately capable of reshaping the world as we know it. Less dramatic, perhaps, than the end of America's 20-year war in Afghanistan, it's nevertheless of greater long-term consequence for the United States and the Middle East. I'm referring to strategic competition with China and Russia. This, too, has significant implications for the conference's core question, whether U.S.-Arab relations. Well before the United States began its withdrawal from Afghanistan, it had identified great power competition as a new strategic imperative. In fact, when I first addressed this conference in 2019, I spoke about the national defense strategy, then only a year old, and its bearing on CENTCOM's posture in the Middle East. This is a conversation in which I am pretty well versed. In nearly three years of key leader engagements across the region, the most common question I receive, sometimes directly, but more often obliquely, is whether strategic competition with burgeoning great powers will come at the expense of our commitment to partners in the region. The short answer to this question is no, but I would like to share with this audience and those partners a fuller expression of our enduring investment in the relationships we've built and the stability that it engenders. First, let me address Afghanistan. For years to come, scholars and the US military will unpack and debate the lessons of America's mission there. But even at this early stage, I can offer a few thoughts that bear on the theme of this conference. Perhaps the most salient is that disappointments should be evaluated against the ambitions that yield them. In 2001, the United States went to war in Afghanistan for the express purpose of bringing the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks to justice and ensuring that Afghanistan would never again serve as a base from which Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups could stage attacks against the United States or the homeland of our allies. We accomplished the first aim in 2011 with the killing of Osama bin Laden. In pursuit of the second, we undertook an ambitious effort to inoculate Afghanistan against the scourge of radical terrorism, in part by fostering a representative pluralistic society that would guarantee a better future for all Afghans. 
Meanwhile, we and our coalition partners made tremendous progress in our campaign against Al-Qaeda and later ISIS Khorasan, harrowing them to the point where they were preoccupied with mere survival and unable to seriously plot, let alone undertake, external operations against us or our friends. That there has not been another 9-11 since 9-11 is no accident. It's a product of these efforts. At the same time, we discovered that we could not be the glue that bound all of Afghanistan's constituencies together into a coherent whole. Militarily, I have little doubt that we could have stayed to advise and assist our partners in the Afghan national defense and security forces indefinitely, a remarkable testament to the resolve and valor of the men and women who make up the armed forces of each nation that contributed to the Afghan mission, yet could and should are two entirely different propositions. And there was no guarantee after the 2020 Doha agreement that our presence would be rewarded with a true unity government anytime soon. Accordingly, President Biden weighed the prospects for a negotiated settlement against the likelihood of renewed hostilities against the Taliban and other strategic priorities and decided after careful deliberation to end America's longest war. He did so with the knowledge that our campaign against violent extremist organizations would continue from bases over the horizon. And that campaign, in fact, continues to this day. As I have said many times already, this campaign will be hard, but not impossible, and we will not relent. Because we did not achieve our loftiest ambitions for the Afghan people, it's hard to escape the immediate conclusion that, that our more ambitious mission in Afghanistan ended in strategic disappointment. Yet the Taliban are already discovering that the country they're ruling today is not one of 20 years ago. A generation of Afghans has since come of age with the benefit of a good education, regardless of gender, access to the internet, and basic public services that so many of us take for granted. Many of them have to this point enjoyed the better life we intended for all Afghans. They cannot now be expected to willingly fit themselves for the yoke of a medieval version of Sharia law from which we liberated their parents. Certain Taliban leaders seem to appreciate this, which is why they have taken pains to depict themselves as some kinder, gentler version of the Taliban. You should color me skeptical skeptical on this, but I know they will have their hands full if they attempt to govern as they had before. Recent events have already reinforced an already strong sense of humility when it comes to my ability to predict the future. But I nevertheless ask you to consider the possibility that over our 20 year campaign in Afghanistan, we did actually create the space needed to plant the seeds for a better future in that country. It was always going to be up to the Afghan people to secure it. And so it remains today. What relevance then does the conclusion of the Afghan campaign have for our Arab partners in the Middle East? In the obvious sense, I would say not much. We do not view our partnerships and the rest of the AOR through the prism of Afghanistan, and neither should our partners view us through that prism. Moreover, our partnerships elsewhere in the region bear virtually no resemblance to the circumstances of Afghanistan. For over 40 years, the United States has acknowledged that a secure and stable Middle East is in our vital national interest, and indeed the interests of the rules-based international order. A secure and stable Middle East is also of obvious special interest to the states comprising the region, with whom we have developed special and enduring relations for decades. Most of these relationships began bilaterally, and no two are identical, but they all rest on the knowledge that the greatest threats to regional prosperity and security are best met together. The nature of our cooperation has varied over time and by country, and will continue to do so in the future. I represent the military dimension of security cooperation in the region, and I am acutely aware of how important this dimension is to our partners. One of the greatest signs, I think, of the United States' continued and unique leadership role in the world is that so many nations are eager to host our forces, among them our partners in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. This is virtually unprecedented, and it derives from two crucial sources. The first is the trust that has developed among our nations and our armed forces via joint training exercises, officer exchanges for professional education, partnership with US National Guard units, and a host of other security cooperation endeavors, that trust has grown stronger over time. The second is, unfortunately, the persistence of a clear threat to the security and stability of the region. 
I'm talking, of course, about the Iranian regime, which has shown time and time again that it is unwilling to abandon its revolutionary zealotry so that it might take its place among the community of nations. I don't need to recount for this audience the various ways in which Iran actively subverts the sovereignty of its neighbors and undermines the security of the region. But neither should I miss an opportunity to call Iran to account for its malign influence in the region. A few cases out of many may illustrate the point. Unable to intimidate Iraqi voters into turning that state into an Iranian client, it has flooded the internet with misinformation about the recent Iraqi election and directed its proxy militia groups to protest the results, sometimes violently. These feeble attempts only demonstrate how limited Iran's influence over Iraq and the Iraqi people actually is. So the militias recently resorted to an assassination attempt on the Iraqi prime minister. Working through and covertly arming these proxies provides Iran with a thin veil of deniability, just as it has in the case of other similar attacks on coalition forces hosted at Iraqi bases. But the Iraqis, correction, but the Iranians and their proxies aren't fooling anyone, and they certainly aren't denning the resolve of the Iraqi people to control their own destiny. The United States, along with our coalition partners, will continue to support the government of Iraq as part of the long-term strategic partnership between our two countries. Reflecting considerable progress in the capabilities of Iraq's security forces, which by the way, did a good job securing the recent election, our role in Iraq's continued campaign against ISIS will now focus on advising, assisting, and enabling the Iraqi security forces. At the invitation of the Iraqi government, we will continue to contribute to the fight against ISIS, ensuring that ISIS never again terrorizes the people of Iraq. Iran, conversely, continues to funnel weapons and supplies to its Houthi clients in Yemen, fueling a civil war in a country that has not known peace for nearly a decade. Moreover, Iran provides the Houthis with advanced unmanned systems with which they terrorize Saudi Arabia and threaten freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. The United States remains committed to a peaceful negotiated settlement of the Yemeni civil war, one that ends one of the world's worst humanitarian crises and serves the interests of the Yemeni people and the region as a whole. But the prospects for such a peace will remain elusive while Iran's bloody thumb tips the scales of the conflict. Their objective is nothing more than mayhem, regardless of the unconscionable suffering it opposes upon the Yemeni people. I could go on and own even more about the other ways in which the regime in Tehran undermines the region's security, from state-sanctioned piracy in the Arabian Gulf to actively fomenting conflict in Syria, Lebanon, and Gaza. Instead, I will reiterate my assessment that we remain in a state of contested deterrence with Iran a contest in which our manifest capabilities and demonstrated will prevent the Iranians from committing yet greater outrages while encouraging a diplomatic solution to some of the issues that divide us. Yet, Iran continues to believe that it can follow the diplomatic track while simultaneously facilitating proxy attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. This is an exceptionally dangerous game, one that carries grave risk for Iran if the militia groups it supports continue their irresponsible attacks. Our commitment to our Arab Gulf partners, on the other hand, remains steadfast, and it's a commitment that cannot be measured in forward force presence, which is always fluctuating on the basis of our efforts to balanize readiness, modernization, and global posture. We are, after all, an expeditionary force, capable like no other in history of flowing forces to the decisive theater and over strategic distances. Working hand in hand with our partners in the region, we have built out a system of bases that allows us to do this with optimal efficiency and flexibility. But there remains more that we can do together. The most obvious is our continued work toward truly integrated air and missile defense across the region. Central Command is poised to facilitate this whenever and wherever we can, but our eventual success hinges on diplomatic agreement among the effective nations. I have reason for optimism. Last year's Abraham Accords demonstrated that we are at the cusp of a new era in the Middle East, one in which we can set aside historical differences in the name of a common, better future, following the example of Egypt and Israel in 1979 and of Jordan and Israel in 1994. This new era opens the possibility of supplanting so many bilateral agreements with genuine multilateral arrangements, arrangements for collective security that will underpin the region's stability and prosperity. 
Here is the region's most pressing need and its greatest opportunity. Before closing, I'd like to offer our, some final thoughts on what light our recent withdrawal from Afghanistan actually has shed on our other commitments in the Middle East. First, it has drawn the Middle East place in the broader strategic picture into sharper focus. It is now easy and easier to recognize that the central region is appropriately enough central to the United States strategic competition with China and Russia. Both China and Russia have worked diligently to extend their influence throughout the region, and they are developing bases astride the world's most important maritime choke points. This is especially important to China, as virtually all of its maritime and overland belts and roads run directly to the Central Command area of responsibility. I mentioned earlier the uniqueness of the United States role as the guarantor of an international order that safeguards the free flow of trade and ideas among all nations, partners and competitors alike. This remains a fundamental interest of the United States, one that if anything elevates the importance of the central region at this moment. Of the two seismic events I mentioned at the opening, this is the more pretentious, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. Finally, the withdrawal from Afghanistan showed the world how many and how gracious the United States friends are. Simply put, we would not have been able to conduct the largest airborne non-combatant evacuation operation in history without the crucial support and generous assistance of many allies and partners, including Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. We owe these countries a tremendous debt of gratitude, as do the tens of thousands of Afghans who will know a better future thanks to our partners' unflinching support of this mission. And at the same time, this reveals something about what kind of friend the United States is. No other nation in the world could have picked up the phone to so many nations, including many outside the central region, to ask this sort of favor and receive such an overwhelming response. It says a lot, I think, about what the United stands for in the world and what it will continue to stand for with our partners in the Middle East. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you this morning, and I hope the rest of the conference goes very well. Thank you, General McKenzie. My goodness, um, given the numerous and diverse uh, countries, culturally, socially, politically, geopolitically, geostrategically, militarily, in your area of responsibility, it's no easy task uh, to be able to summarize, focus, and prioritize uh, what are the most pressing uh, issues, needs, concerns, uh, interests, and key national security and other foreign policy uh, objectives. Uh, when U.S. Central Command began, uh, its prospects were uncertain. Indeed, its original name was the Rapid uh, Deployment Force. People used to joke that it was rather rapid. Uh, it had not deployed, and its uh, force uh, did not exist. It had to be cobbled together from, uh, from other commands. Uh, its uh, soldiers bore no battle ribbons. Uh, there were no flags from previous campaigns, obviously because uh, the command did not exist. Uh, but it has emerged to be what it is and remains and has been now for four decades and counting. Uh, this is the rock of defense planning, security planning, uh, the prospects uh, for people's comfort and competence and being able to anticipate, prepare and predict the lives in front of them that they might be more meaningful and purposeful. Uh, there's much that you have offered, General, uh, that is otherwise hard to come by uh, in our media or in open sources uh, material. Uh, but you have cut through uh, this labyrinth, this network, this maze of what is oftentimes seen as uncertain and confusing and unduly complex. Uh, we're in your debt, General, and you have every good wish for your continued effectiveness and to build from strength to strength with their strategic friends, partners, and allies. My best to you and your staff, sir. Thank you. Sir, good day, and I wish you the very best for the remainder of your conference.